Hi there and welcome to this video. Auto scaling is essential knowledge that is important and used by most leading technology organizations. And you can pretty much guarantee that almost every service that you use and rely on will be making use of auto scaling behind the scenes. In this video, we're going to be talking about auto scaling and we'll cover different types of auto scaling approaches, such as reactive, scheduled, and predictive. We'll also discuss how auto scaling could be leveraged in different ways with Kubernetes. So, what is auto scaling? Auto scaling is a pattern we can adopt to facilitate automatic scaling of infrastructure or application components according to metrics or other requirements, therefore allowing our infrastructure to adjust accordingly as required. The term auto in auto scaling can be interpreted in different ways and both of them work really, really well. So auto for automatic or automated. The scaling aspect refers to scaling up, scaling down and scaling across. Auto scaling is particularly important in cloud environments as unused resources will generally have a cost implication associated with them. So when we're considering auto scaling, what are the types of metrics that we would be basing this on? CPU and memory are the ones that most people think of when they ask this question, but it really does depend on your application. Different applications will have very different priorities. For example, when you think of a service like Netflix, Behind the scenes, there's going to be a lot of transcoding, i.e. converting video between different formats. So, for example, mobile phones, tablets, laptops, you're going to have your high quality such as 4K or even low quality for those who are making use of mobile data. Given this, a company like Netflix will most likely have a large reliance on GPU when converting videos between formats. With auto scaling, there's different approaches and combinations that may be used by an organization. So firstly, reactive auto scaling. This could be triggered when metrics hit a given threshold and we react to that threshold being reached. So for example, if we see a sudden increase in a threshold for a given amount of time, auto scaling may be actioned as a reactive safeguard. In this example, we have time along the bottom and a number of servers on the left hand side. Here we're starting with one server and as we hit a threshold, this then scales to four servers. As our workload decreases, we may react and go back to one server. Then throughout the workday, we react accordingly. So you can see there that the number of servers relates accordingly to what we need at any given point in time. Reactive auto scaling is great if your workload can react quickly without incurring or being affected by latency as the auto scaling process takes place. Another variation is scheduled auto scaling. In some organizations, especially those associated with financial services, specific dates in the year may be targeted for scheduled auto scaling. A good example could be end of month batch process in where an organization knows that its workload is going to increase exponentially at specific dates and times. Here, for example, we know that we have a peak in our workload at around 9 a.m. So rather than actually relying on reactive auto scaling, we could actually schedule auto scaling ahead of time, then keep the rest of our time frames as reactive. Predictive auto scaling is an interesting area and it's where metrics are used in conjunction with the likes of AI and machine learning, therefore allowing auto scaling to scale with a head start of what may or may not occur in a reactive situation. In this example, over time, the AI or machine learning could learn that 9 a.m. is a busy time. As an advantage over the scheduled variation that we saw previously, it's able to make more informed auto scaling decisions. You can see here, rather than us actually guessing that we'd require eight servers, the AI machine learning may learn that nine servers is more appropriate for our workload. With our understanding of different 
types of autoscaling. Let's now focus in particular on the different types of autoscaling. Vertical scaling scaler is a change of configuration to the underlying infrastructure, as in the existing resources that are already available. From a bare metal computing viewpoint, this would be adding additional resources, so CPU, memory, hard disks, to existing compute to vertically scale the overall resources available. Although this is possible with physical compute, it isn't really that practical as it involves physical interaction with hardware. Typically, vertical scaling applies more to virtual computing. In this example, we have our compute, which could be clustered and shared by the use of hypervisors, such as VMware ESXi or Hyper-V. We then have a virtual machine with a designated amount of CPU cores, memory, and disk. With virtual machines, there are often mechanisms that allow resources to be vertically scaled, and in some cases, without downtime. A good example of this is the likes of VMware ESXi. Scaling down, however, may incur a power down or a reboot of the resource in question. So depending on your solution, your mileage may vary. Theory. Horizontal scaling is the addition or removal of resources in relation to the existing resources. So as an example, we may have an application that is running across a set of servers, and this could comprise of a standard compute infrastructure, so CPU, memory, and storage. We could horizontally scale the application to utilize more compute resources. This therefore could increase the overall CPU, memory, and storage. Whilst this is a fairly simple example and we've outlined compute resources in general, there are different solutions for horizontal scaling and some may focus more specifically on specific resources more so than others. Others may actually focus on the scaling of complete clusters, i.e. full compute nodes. So from a cloud native viewpoint, horizontal versus vertical scaling. In the cloud native ecosystem, there is typically much more of an emphasis on horizontal scaling than vertical. But depending on the needs of your application, both horizontal and vertical scaling may be advantageous and you should definitely consider both. When considering auto scaling, it's very important to consider the surrounding components. Automation is extremely important and through automation, we can achieve the desired outcomes with both speed and consistency. In turn, this then provides us cost savings with public cloud providers. Lastly, it's also important that we consider testing as part of our automation strategy. We need to ensure that an application can both scale and perform as expected when order scaled. If you think about this from a distributed compute viewpoint, horizontal scaling increases the complexity of data sharing. There'll be more resources, so more routes between those resources. You'd also have to consider concurrent where the workload is now distributed across these different resources. Designing your applications with metrics first will therefore help to verify and confirm that your application can both scale and perform as expected as your use of auto scaling increases. Lastly, some specific areas which are worth knowing about and investigating further. So firstly, cluster auto scaler. This is a tool that can be used to automatically adjust the size of a Kubernetes cluster based on the workload, i.e. if there are insufficient resources or a node is under you lies. There's a related GitHub project for this and you can view this here if you like. Next up, more options for Kubernetes, horizontal and vertical pod autoscalers. These are often abbreviated as HPA and VPA. HPA scales the number of replicas for an application, whilst VPA scales the resource requests and limits of a pod, essentially like what we saw earlier, but at a pod level rather than a virtual machine. There's also an offering which is known as header, which is why I chose this top in particular for this video. What is Kedder? Kedder is an event-driven solution that makes use of scaled objects. No, 
that's actually underlined there, so this may be worth remembering or researching further if you're doing the KCNA exam. Importantly, with the use of KEDA, there's opportunities to scale to zero, which is obviously fantastic from a cost savings viewpoint. If you recall in another video, I mentioned that Knative also supports scale to zero from a serverless viewpoint. So, to finalize, and let's see if we can actually do this. Auto scaling accelerates application availability and access. Always add automation as an appropriate action and approach. Anyway, auto scaling acts as an advantage. That's it for this video. I hope you found this super useful and we'll continue our voyage of discovery in the next one.